welcome everyone. Uh, firstly, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you're watching this, whether you're watching this live or you're watching this on playback. Uh, this is the first of the uh, Jobs and Controls webinar session that, that we're going to be hosting, hopefully many more to come. Um, look, super excited, first and foremost, to, to be joined by, you know, what I would say are an expert panel uh, from around our business today. We'll introduce each other shortly, but firstly, I just wanted to set the scene for today's topic. Obviously, as the title suggests, it's savings and sustainability. There's more to the story. And I think just to set that in even more context, I think all of us hopefully that are joining this call recognize that now is the time that we need to act more than ever. I think there's a lot of really good things going on across industry within the healthcare space, but I think there's a definite recognition that we need to accelerate. So hopefully today you get, get some tips, some tricks, some, some kind of hints as to how we can help support in doing that. But first, just to, as, a, as a further reminder, you know, we know that from an IPCC perspective, we have less than seven years to cut global emissions by 40 percent if we want to reach net zero by 2050. And that will hopefully keep us within that one and a half degree temperature rise boundary that, that we're looking to, to be within. And then if we zoom in further on the NHS, we know that, you know, from an NHS perspective on the emissions that the NHS controls, they want to reduce them to net zero by 2040. And then there's the further ambition of an 80% reduction in these emissions from 2028 to 2032. So I think there's a lot of a lot of good stuff, as I said earlier, going on. Um, I hope you're ready for what will be a, an interactive session between the panelists here. What we're going to do is we're going to look at opportunities and success, success stories when it comes to driving energy efficiency and sustainability. We're going to look at technologies available and specifically focus on models like energy performance contracting but also looking at digital services, how they enable sustainability and energy efficiency, as well as heat pump technology when it comes to energy security and the likes of that. We'll go through some specific considerations and how to maximize the benefits of these technologies and what you as organizations need to be looking to consider in order to maximize the, the impact that these technologies have. And we'll also touch a little bit on finance and what finance mechanisms are around to really support the deployment of this technology. But look, firstly, before we do that, I'm just going to pause for a brief second and we're going to share a video on some great work that our Asset Plus team, part of Johnson Controls, has been doing with NHS Fife. And this video is also featured in a new series with IEMA and Content with Purpose, titled Transforming the World to Sustainability. We'll then come back and I'll introduce the team. NHS Fife has bold sustainability ambitions. Our aim is to have 100% renewable heat by 2038 and be a net zero health service by 2040 at the latest. Right from the start, we were very clear where we wanted to go, but we also knew we needed expert help to get us there. We've been working with Asset Plus, who are a subsidiary of Johnson Controls for the last three years now. They won a tender in 2021 to support NHS Fife with energy saving measures. We had the strategic vision and they've supported us with the implementation strategy. I've been working this project since its inception. Johnson Controls um, provided the design, the installation, and we're now doing the measurement and verification of the savings to prove we're actually achieving what we set out to do. Over the course of the last three years, we have installed solar PV, we have made adjustments to our large freezers, we have replaced our building energy management system, we have installed LED lighting, and we have replaced our hot water calorifier with a more efficient method. The benefits of these measures is that it allows NHS Fife to be much more efficient and save significantly on energy. We are now at the measurement and verification stage of the project and we are seeing significant reductions in energy consumption, which equates to a significant saving for NHS Fife. The graphs there are showing full load hours, how much money you guys have actually saved. Although it is going down for November and December, so a lot of people think, weather's bad, you earn nothing. It's not true. It's based on how much radiation is coming down from the sun. So even though it's clouded over, you still make something, you still save. Yeah. 
So it's important to have these meetings uh, regular with the client to show them the different type of savings that are coming in through each of the different sectors. It means that they can plan for other sustainability actions. They can take forward to other health centres, other hospitals, if they want to install things such as solar, perhaps upgrade their insulation, that type of thing. Going forward, that they know that this works and they can have trust in the fact that what we've said we'd do, what we'd install, is actually uh, been able to be delivered. I think we're at a time where it's incumbent on all organisations, especially public sector, to be committed to sustainability. It's the only way we're going to achieve real change. But equally, it's also incumbent on people like me to spend public money wisely, to maximise our impact and create social good. That means collaborating, working with experts like Rob to make our ambitions a reality. Super. So hopefully you all found that little teaser of the video uh, interesting. And I think we're going to touch on a number of the, the topics that we, we delivered there in, in a more general term um, during the discussion. So look, without further ado, uh, it's about time for me to introduce this fantastic team uh, across the room here. So I'm going to come to you, Paul Burnett, first, if you want to just briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of background, I'm the co-founder of Asset Plus. Asset Plus was a specialist business we set up eight years ago that is 100% focused on decarbonising non-domestic buildings through energy performance contracts. Um, my experience, I've been in the energy infrastructure sector for just over 30 years now. Um, and certainly have witnessed firsthand uh, the emergence of decarbonisation, which has been probably the slowest emerging market ever. But we are here now, um, which is good news. And, and, and so in terms of our current focus within Johnson Controls, it's been integrating Asset Plus into the Johnson Controls business and looking at opportunities how we could grow that into new markets and grow the existing market share we've got using the, uh, the background and the investment from Johnson Controls. So, yeah, welcome to everyone. Super. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next to uh, Paul Tobin. Yep, uh, Paul Tobin, good to uh, meet everybody. Um, I work in our digital sales team, leading the healthcare vertical in the UK. Um, I've been here at Johnson Controls or JCI for just six months. So really enjoying my time here. Previous to Johnson Controls, I spent 16 years at Microsoft working in their cloud business. Super, and last but by no means least, Richard. Morning, Paul. Morning, Paul. Morning, Paul. <laughs> so I've been in the uh, in the HVAC environment all my working life, and I'm very proud to say that. So for the last 20 years, I've been a part of Johnson Controls. I came from the York product range. Uh, that's where I started in 2004. And I've had a huge influence on where we've been applying our products for the last 20 years. I started in their engineering team, and, uh, and I've been very proud to say I manage a team of healthcare professionals who specialise in applications moving into the uh, operating theatres, scanner worlds, and obviously with the NHS sector. I also am privileged to say that I, uh, as part of the vertical market within HVAC, I'm, I'm in control of that to a certain extent, at least. I, uh, I get to influence a lot of what happens in that space and very proud to say I work with an awful lot of very, very professional people. So good morning, everybody. Super. And for full transparency for everyone on the, the call, you didn't have to have the first name as Paul to be able to be part of our session today. It's just how this uh, materialised. So, uh, look, welcome and thank you all for, for kind of being on the, on the call today. Um, what we're going to do now is just get into some questions and it's going to be a very much a kind of an open dialogue amongst the team here. But we're going to hopefully touch on some real key topics. So. I'm first going to come to you, actually, Paul Burnett. So when it, when you look at um, the healthcare space, what, what are some of the specific uh, opportunities and also some of the challenges that, that organisations you're in contact with face when it comes to implementing decarbonisation programmes? Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. Um, a good question to kick it off with. And um, I think it's first by looking at the importance of the healthcare sector in, in terms of delivering uh, on moving towards net zero carbon for the UK. Now it's responsible for four to five percent of the total carbon emissions in the UK. It's responsible for 30 percent of the public sector carbon emissions. Um, and, but the good news is 80 to 90 percent of that is uh, associated with heating and power in the buildings, which is all controllable. Um, the specific challenges, you know, uh, the healthcare sector face is is a lot around the criticality of the services. You know, they're extremely important services. Um, the nature in terms of 24/7 um 
it, it, you know, it, that brings a lot of uh, concerns because the resilience that they, they, they need to, to keep the services running 24 seven. Um, and, and, and the big issue, you know, you know, it's particularly with uh, the healthcare sector is the volumes of stakeholders. There's a lot of stakeholders involved, all have an important part to play. So taking people on that journey becomes difficult um, and, and often don't have the internal expertise to really know how to do it and how to unlock it. So I, mean, I think that's probably the, the context of it. Yeah, very interesting. I think, you know, when I when I look at the kind of the challenge that we face and I look at the technology that Johnson Controls provide, you know, we've got a lot that, you know, for Richard will come to in a minute around HVAC and Paul, obviously you're you're driving kind of turnkey projects. I think, you know, one of the things we're obviously seeing is the the onset and the the enabler of technology, digital technology specifically in this space. And so maybe Paul Tobin, if I can come to you, how are you seeing kind of the digital space really supporting this drive around net zero um, and, and what organizations need to achieve? Yep, sure. So the, the digital platform we have here at Johnson Controls, um, we call Open Blue. And for, for us, you know, um, of all the emissions that are generated, 40% of those emissions are coming from buildings, as we know. So we need to do something about it. And obviously, from a digital perspective, our answer is Open Blue. And Open Blue can really do three things at a very high level for our clients. One, and most importantly, arguably, is to initially give them that visibility of the data. You know, at the minute, across buildings, um, not only in healthcare, but just generally, you know, often that data, that information is there, it's just in silos within buildings. Therefore, um, Open Blue, by the nature of its name, is open, has those open APIs, can connect to both first party and third party building management systems or at a metering level or an equipment level. So again, the first job I think for the digital platform Open Blue is to give our clients visibility as to what's happening in their building around energy. And then being able to um, take that a stage further and help them with their ESG reporting um, and you know make that as simple as possible, particularly around scope one and scope two. And then we, we also work with Microsoft around addressing um, scope three. The Open Blue platform will also allow you to um, compare and contrast buildings so you can start to spot patterns around you know how different buildings are performing and therefore you know, make recommendations for maybe the buildings that aren't performing as you would like. Um, and then th there's also the ability to um, set your own goals and your targets within the Open Blue platform. And the Open Blue platform will allow you to visualize how you're tracking against those targets. So you might have a target of X percent over a year. And again, it will, Open Blue will show you what you'd need to do to hit that percentage target or indeed you can put a monetary target on it to say if you want to save x pounds on your energy um you know then again it will allow you to visualize how you're performing and make recommendations about how you can make sure you hit the, the target so visibility around the data is is probably number one the second thing i'd say is um around connected equipment so your your assets your your chillers your hvac system your air handling units whatever it might be again both first party and third party open blue our digital platform allows you to connect all those up start applying via artificial intelligence and machine learning um you know starts allowing you to predict load requirements starts to be able to look um internally of, around what's going to be needed in a critical environment like like a hospital, as, as Paul Burnett mentioned, um, but also look externally to weather conditions. So again, start to have a level of intelligence around what's happening, what the weather's going to be doing, therefore where those set points need to be. And then ultimately, obviously, if if the set points are where only where they need to be and operating at the optimum level, our clients are going to be saving energy, going to be saving money, saving emissions. And then the other knock on for that is obviously, again, that equipment itself, we can extend the life of that equipment if we're making sure, again, that it's not overworking or underperforming. It's just hitting um, the, you know, the right level that it needs to. And then the other thing that uh, Open Blue enables our clients to do is schedule works orders. So it will spot, again, if there's an, an issue or an anomaly or something uh, impacting the equipment negatively around predictive maintenance. And it can make sure you can schedule that work for engineers 
to do a site visit if necessary or fix it remotely if, if that's possible. And I think the other thing just to add to that that clients really appreciate is OpenBlue also allows you to monetize, if you like, or, or see the monetary value of each of those issues. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for the client, allows them to prioritize, you know, which ones are costing them the most and therefore get to those ones and fix those ones first. And then the third and final thing I'd say is um, around space management. And that can mean different things to different people, but we have lots of clients, for example, doing things around indoor air quality, making sure those sensors are connected to OpenBlue, understanding um, uh, things like how OpenBlue can help remove viruses, airborne viruses, again, important in the healthcare sector. But there's a whole heap of studies around how positive air, indoor air quality also helps with cognitive function. And again, if we think about, you know, um, clinicians, doctors, nurses, etc., you know, a critical environment to make sure we get that right. And then the final thing I'd just say, underpinning all those three outcomes is the security element of OpenBlue. Um, you know, we use zero trust architecture to make sure that we've got end-to-end -end encryption of all of that data so that as any data moves from the building to the cloud and back to do that analysis, that data stays secure um, and is protected at all times. Super. Brilliant. Lo lots of good information there, Paul. A lot of kind of uh, impact. Good job this is being recorded so anyone can kind of reference back. But I think some great stuff in there. And I think, you know, having, you know, I've been in this space, I didn't do my formal introduction, but I've been in the kind of construction and energy solution space for circa 20 years. And I think if I was to kind of cite one of the biggest changes and the biggest kind of advantages that we now see in be being able to drive change is this digital element. And, and I often refer to it as the glue. It's the glue that brings everything together that prevents, to your point, Paul, earlier, those siloed data sets that ultimately mean siloed decision making. And actually mm -hmm. now we're able to look at things a lot more holistically, look at things that are interconnected. And it's not just about the kind of the, the generating as assets within a building, but it's also around patient safety. It's also around, you know, you know how many beds are, are occupied at any one time in a given space. It's all of that that has to feed into the ecosystem to enable organizations to make the right decisions, both from an energy perspective, but also for, you know, ultimately the patients in this space that, that are being cared for. So really, really good there, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, I want to just zoom in on some specifics now. So we've talked kind of, you know, high level. We, we kind of talked a little bit about projects in the, in the assets plus space. We've talked about digital. Richard, I, I want to kind of touch on a, a specific topic that I, I don't know. There's not one conversation I've had in the last six months that hasn't revolved around a heat pump. <laughs> right. So so I wouldn't mind if you could just talk us a little bit about why why is that? What what are some of the real benefits that, that heat pump technology can provide, especially in this space? And how is it ultimately part of that ecosystem that addresses net zero? Well, let's start with the basics. Um I, I think it's important to address why heat pumps are used. I think you're right enough. This is an evolution, as Paul alluded to very early on. It's an evolution. We've been waiting a long time for this to happen in our space. In the HVAC world, we've been working on heat pumps for like 30, 40 years, maybe more in many cases. But certainly for us here and now, it's all about the decarbonization. And what we're trying to achieve is a sustainable decarbonization. So the only way we've got, the only open options we have at the moment is going to heat pumps. The reason we're going to heat pumps, we talk about the energy consumed. So when we look at uh, the combustion boiler systems, we know that the COP on a combustion boiler will always be less than one because there's always a loss. With the heat pump, an absorbed power of one kilowatt of energy produces at a minimum of three kilowatts of energy. Now there's the key driver straight away. And then when we start looking at the different applications we have in the heat pump world, we look at air source heat pumps, water source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. We start talking about all these different aspects of where we get that energy from. That needs to be thought through in every application. And certainly with hospitals are concerned, we, we look at space and power and all of the available assets we have. And when we say, right, can we put a ground source heat pump in? And the advantage of going to ground source then is we get a very stable foundation for the heat pump to work. And that stable foundation is gives us a guaranteed payback. So the efficiency might get up to three, four, five, if we're lucky. And then when we start looking at air source heat pumps, obviously we're open to the environment, the ambient temperature alters. 
So believe it or not, the warmer the ambient, the more efficient the heat pump is, which isn't always what we need to know, but uh, <laughs> it's the fact of it. And when we drop down to sub-zero ambient temperatures, the efficiency drop away. So this is where the balance needs to be brought in. And, there's, and, and then that's where we start to learn about the intelligent part. So I've used this point a few times when I've spoken about heat pumps. There is no one machine that fixes everything. What we need to be thinking about is the situation, the building, how it's used. How, uh, I've got to say Paul. I can't say Paul every time. Can I say Paul, Paul, and Paul? <laughs> <I've> got... <laughs> As we were talking about the Open Blue solution, we were uh, we were talking about that digital integration, and that's that's a key part. But we've got to be intelligent about how we use it. And the other term is being creative. So I think when we start looking at applications between ground sourced, water sourced, uh, air sourced, we've got a we've got a good range of equipment. And then obviously with those efficiencies, we've we've got to maximize in every case. And being intelligent, being creative, but ultimately listening to what that customer needs and, and the stakeholders of the estates. I think that's yeah. the key bit for me. Super. Thank you, Richard. Really, really good insight there. Um Paul Burnett, I'm going to come to you again now because I think you know one of the things that you know is clear to see just just in amongst our conversation here is that there is a, a plethora of things that can be done to address the challenges faced and to ultimately get us to a position where you know organisationally, societally, we hit the targets we need to hit. But I think again, you know, from my experience, there's often kind of barriers and challenges with when it comes to rolling out these solutions for whatever reason. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, what are what are some of the challenges that you see with organizations really having the desire to implement these kind of technologies, but but are maybe struggling with either organizational alignment or finance on, you know, what do you see and, and how are you, you know, in your capacity and in your team's capacity helping to address some of those challenges? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, there there are a lot of barriers, and um, I think there's always a desire. Um, but the problem is, you know, sitting there, you've got a day job, um, you can know that you need to change things. Um, you know, and a lot of facilities across the UK are very um, very antiquated. They were built when fossil fuels and energy consumption wasn't particularly an issue. Um, you know, and they've generally been added to over the years, um, and the service is extended. So they become to a point where they're they're not fit for purpose, but they need to keep running. Um, and finance is always thrown in as, as a barrier and really finance has never been a barrier and any projects I've ever delivered over all of the years, finance has never stopped us. It, admittedly, it can be complex and you need to understand, you know, particularly, you know, with an NHS trust, you need to understand where are we with their CDL, which is the capital um, department expenditure limit, because um, where they are, well, that can often dictate, does it need to be off balance sheet? Does it need to be on balance sheet? Um, and, and where the government grant money has come in over the last three or four years, you know, that's helped NHS trusts massively because suddenly there's there's money there, free money uh, to decarbonise, you know, and it will be linked to removing fossil fuel uh, use, uh, out of date fossil fuel use to stop that cycle of people replacing a gas boiler or a fossil fuel boiler or heating source with another one because that's easy to do, it's relatively cheap and it it breaks that cycle um and that's been you know that's been really beneficial and it's really moved people on um but they're often in, in, you know it's a real quandary because you look at it they think okay we we've got to decarbonize but also we want to save money so you've saved money you want to go let's do electricity reduction measures so we're going to put some solar pv do some led lighting things like that which is which is a good thing to do but electric from the grid perspective from an electricity grid you know that's decarbonising at a rate of knots with the with, with uh, onshore wind, offshore wind, connecting solar farms, nuclear. Um, so that is where you are going to get your financial savings, reducing electricity. So to replace a, a, a gas boiler with a or a steam system with a heat pump system, um, financially the savings are they, they're still there. It's particularly if you design it well and do it well, but they're nothing like in comparison to electricity. The, the electrical saving measures. If you do electrical saving measures, over time your carbon savings are really getting eroded. So you need to foster the re re realistically need to bundle all of it together, which is where an energy performance contract can work really well, particularly if it's if it's well thought through and structured. 
you can pull all of that together. So A, you are saving money, you are moving your carbon emission uh, reductions on significantly, um, and, and you can structure that from a financial point of view um, well. So it just needs to be addressed early. And as I said, we talked about you know silos and stakeholders and things like that. All of that needs to be addressed early on and people brought along the journey because they'll all have specific requirements and they all need to be addressed and thought through in terms of how do we deal with that? How do we build that into the program? How do we build that into the project? Because um, hospitals can be complex and you know the beauty is that they consume a lot of energy and as a result, a lot of carbon emissions. So you can really do a, you know make a big impact. Um, but they take time. So the yeah. early year engage and think it through because the worst thing they can do is just go off at a tangent and do one measure. Yeah. You know, oh, look at that. We saved a load of money, but you now you've negated the opportunity to do something else. So it's just a balance and it's getting someone on board early to really help them along the journey. Yeah. I think it's a really important point that actually, mm. Paul, in terms of that, that holistic consideration of mm. multiple energy carbon reduction conservation measures whatever you want to call them so that you could actually bring into play those technologies that maybe have you know if you look at in silo a longer payback or even are yeah. struggling to be justified because of the the cost and the and the direct savings but when brought into more of a holistic you know project that's got a guarantee it starts to make sense both financially yeah, yeah. economically and, and otherwise so i think it's a really really good point um Richard, I just want to come back to you again, and then and then Paul, I've got a real question on kind of you know digital integration and all that sort of stuff. But Richard, when it comes to again zooming in on heat pumps, I think mm -hmm. again alongside the question that I get very often around you know talk to us about heat pumps, there's often this kind of well you know challenging question that says well we've either done it before and it's not worked or it didn't do what we said it was going to do why do you think those challenges exist and what would be your recommendation to anyone that's listening who's thinking about this sort of thing to kind of start to explore um, to make sure it's effective you know that that's a really really good point right <clears throat> so if you've experienced if you've had a bad experience you've got a question why and the first thing whenever I listen or whenever I approach a project or a customer or an estate you've got to sit and listen and that's the key Paul Burnett's just said that, Paul Tobin said it, we've said it. Listening and understanding, taking that keyholder advice, the stakeholder advice, sorry, and the uh, the estates team's advice is, is critical. So mm -hmm. it's all about that application. It's about understanding where the best fit at the right time. So just buying a heat pump, plonking it on the wall and saying, there you go, our problem solved, is not gonna work. What we've gotta do is dive into the detail of the systems heat map the building, understand where the key points of load are, find the simultaneous loadings, but more importantly, look to where the frustrations have come from and, and make sure we really understand that building. And then when we apply some intelligent control to it, that's when this whole piece comes together. So when we've got open blue, when we've got a fantastic control system, we're managing it. We're not running it unnecessarily. We're not underperforming it because it's too low in the ambient condition. We Potentially, we're getting a balance between using a small amount of combustion boilers and a little mm -hmm. bit of air source, maybe. Either way, whatever we're doing has to be smart in how we're applying it. But the key point for me, Paul, is, is listening. Yeah, very interesting. And, and I think, you know, again, one, one of the things that I've kind of used when I'm chatting to customers as well is that, you know, what we're talking about here is, is the installation in the first sense of doing a project, doing a heat yeah. pump, doing an EPC. How important do you think it is around the ongoing maintenance of those assets to ensure that the long-term savings benefit is is realized? I mean, is, is that something you see that's kind of often an afterthought and actually needs to be really baked in? How, what's the what's the view on, you know, I'll come more generally to the round, round to the team on that. Well, I'll kick it off if you don't mind then. <laughs> so we're on a roll now guys yeah. so it maintenance is key right these are machines they're mechanical devices when you're when you're talking about heat pumps so it, it needs to be maintained it has to be maintained what we're looking to do is optimize its performance in every way keeping it clean making sure there's nothing in no, no loose connections making sure the connections for the interface is is right and that continuous commissioning plan as well that's key to this for me once you've set it up, that's today. 
there's the design point. What happens tomorrow as the building changes, as the occupancy changes, as the level of application changes? Make sure that's a continuation in your maintenance program. Do we do a regular commissioning plan? So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I'd, I'd, I'd underline that. I mean, it, particularly in the healthcare sector, it's particularly from our, our perspective in terms of guaranteeing energy savings through an energy performance contract. It's very difficult to do that if you're not doing the maintenance. Um, particularly, these can be quite big assets. So, a design, build, operate, maintain. You know, a true ESCO type model over a fifteen plus year pr a period is where it needs to be because you 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 then transferred that risk to someone whose interest is. To make sure those those assets are run um, effectively and efficiently, um, and if you can see an opportunity to do something earlier and invest in it to create more energy savings, then you're going to do that as a third party whose whose full, sole focus is is to make sure those assets run and achieve energy savings. So it is it, yeah, it's definitely the right thing to do. Yeah, and just Super. building on that, Paul, from the digital side of things, obviously there's today's state. But obviously, from a digital perspective, we, we frequently use digital twins to look at what tomorrow could look like and simulate what that plant environment would look like if, you know, the client took action A, B or C, and then understanding what those outcomes would be. And I think that's a really key message, at least in the digital side, and I'm sure across JCI, that this can't just be a nice to do or a nice to have. This has to have a value proposition that delivers a return on investment and is very clear. And like I say, we can use digital twin technology to enable um, a, a view into the futurist, if you like, as if you took this action with this piece of equipment, these would be the outcomes. And then we can have a ROI discussion with the client, which, um, like I say, I think is really powerful. Yeah, and I think it's it's super important as well. You know, when you, you know, we talked about it right at the start that, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the technologies uh, to address the challenge exist. Right. We know what they are. We know we know how to deploy them. Deploy them. There are different ways and mechanisms that we can deploy to make them more efficient. But I think when you then look at the digital space, and I'll come back to you again in a minute, Paul. But I think you know back to that point of it, the, it being the glue that you know joins it all together. I think you know in my head, the, you know the ability to then to be a lot smarter on how you maintain these vital pieces of equipment in a proactive way rather than an what has been you know before the onset of digital much more reactive i.e you don't know unless something starts knocking banging stops working or whatever you know even even when you're doing the kind of the the, the regular maintenance inspection sometimes things just happen and and can throw throw a system off so i think you know the value of the deployment of technology to support that uh, in a more proactive way is incredibly important and and just on that then so how um you know, when you're looking at deploying digital technologies, and, and especially when you're looking at and deploying them where they have to link to varying different systems, you know, client facing systems, you know, building management systems, you know, door access systems. How, how do you, uh, you know, in the team work in collaboration with with organizations to ensure that, you know, the system is holistic in nature and we don't miss something when it comes to the implementation? Yeah, it, it comes down to you know, something Richard mentioned there about listening. And I think, you know, for us, what we're trying to do is to make this not a client supplier relationship. We're trying to make it a true partnership. So we we as, you know, digital would, um, you know, go down normally on site or over teams if necessary, give that um, view of what the, you know, deeper value proposition, what the return on investment looks like from a digital deployment perspective provide the client with a view of what the dashboards look like, you know, the, the the reports that are there for them to use now, but also the ability within Open Blue to build your own reports on things that might be interesting to you. And then within the Open Blue organization, we also have our own dedicated um, engineers. So again, they're able to do site surveys, do audits of the buildings, no two, no two buildings are the same as we know. So make sure that before we even get on site and think about deployment, we have a good understanding about what that building looks like, what the systems are in there today. And so that when we do go into that deployment phase, which again, we have our very own dedicated Open Blue engineers to go and do that deployment. We're working with the client teams hand in hand. There are no surprises because we did the audit. We know what we're walking into and we have a very, you know, 
fixed, if you like, um, scope of works, timeline, and working in true partnership with the organization. And then at the tail end, if you like, post, post deployment, we also have um, a customer success team and they continue to work with the client post deployment and they can provide training. But it's really important, I think, that that ongoing value is realized via the system so they can help the different um, estates directors, the building management team to realize the value of their open blue deployment and help them you know, spot things that they might not be aware of that's happening in their building. So I think, if you like, from, from soup to nuts, we really do try and approach it from a partnership perspective and have that ongoing conversation with the clients so that they can realize the, the, um, the, the value in the investments that they make. Yeah, super, super. Um, Paul Burnett, I want to talk about kind of collaboration and stakeholders, because I think, you know, <clears throat> again, we know, you know, in our own organization, but also in the organizations that we work with that, you know, organizations are incredibly complex nowadays and, and, and rightly so, right? Because there's a lot of stuff that needs to, to happen. There's a lot of people that need to be involved in decision making. There's a lot of people that have knowledge. How in the projects that you're engaged in do you do we support to bring kind of multiple stakeholders together to collaborate? And and, and also how important is that collaboration not only within an internal organization from a client perspective, but also with kind of, you know, let's say JCI ecosystem partners that we may be looking to to, to bring into to play as well. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I mean, we talk to you often about silos and, and the compl complexity of healthcare sector. I mean, all, all sectors have their own complexities. Uh, healthcare service is large. They've got a lot of critical uh, elements to the, to the services they provide. So, in our experience of delivering um, decarbonisation programmes, um, particularly across you know healthcare institutes, is um, er, the earlier we can be engaged, the the better. Um, and what we've tended to then get engaged early, uh, identify the stakeholder groups, use focus groups then to run workshops, uh, you know, and discussions with those to to kind of tease out what are the what are their concerns, what specific requirements have they got running their department or their area that we need to be thinking about in terms of the decarbonisation program. Um, and one of the most critical things is to, for them to have a project sponsor who's overseeing it, who's got authority to make decisions across the NHS Trust and people can look to to make those decisions because we can't, we can guide them and we can say that this is the, where we think you should be going on this. Um, but you need somebody who's got the authority to make those decisions who's heavily involved in it and that could be quite difficult because you know that person will have a job a role already within the organization so that can be tricky and, and you need that link into the finance team within the, the the nhs trust or healthcare board um because you need them on part of that journey it's really critical so they need to understand these you know you build up these are the program you've identified everything you're looking at the different finance options but the earlier you address the finance options um, the, the easier it, it gets because you don't want to then go all that way through, develop an investment growth proposal, stick it in front of the, the finance director or the CFO who says, oh yeah, we can't do that. Because yeah. everybody's wasted time. It was, if you can identify early, what are his issues? What are their issues in yeah. terms of financing within that particular institute? You you can then start to, to unwind that and address it. Um, yeah, and, and 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 that's that's been the key to the success of the ones we've done. You know, and I look at the ones we've done. You know, NHS Fife, uh, the video we saw earlier, which you know, every time I see that, I feel proud about the project we delivered up there. Um, and that was all funded through a grant fund. You know, Scottish uh, Heat Decarbonisation Fund, um, which enabled that project to happen. That project would not have happened without that grant fund, because um, they, you know, and, and it could have happened. It would have been a long term uh, uh, a facility that we could have structured for them, but it would have taken a lot longer. Um, and would have been more complicated. So that worked really well. And then I look at, you know, we talked about the glue of Open Blue. NHS Salisbury is a project we're currently delivering, which is a mixture of, of funding in terms of public sector decarbonisation scheme money, capital zone trust. Um, you know, we're doing heat pumps, we're doing a fabric, we're doing a megawatt of solar PV, we're doing LED lighting, and right in the middle of it, we've got the Open Blue digital technology, which is pulling it all together. So, you know, we're, 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 we can address all of that and get involved um, and, and bring people on the journey, but you do need to be the, the earlier you can engage, the better. Yeah, 
Super. <clears throat> I think that's you've, you've made a perfect segue there, Paul, into kind of, I think we've done a lot of talking around, you know, applications, how we can do it, our view on it. I'd love to kind of, you know, in the, in the time we've got left, just hear some kind of more success stories. And I don't know, Richard, whether you want to kick it off in terms of, you know, okay. wh where have you mm. seen and where have you got examples of where these kind of heat pump deployments have really gone well? And, and can you just give some of those, those examples for us? Well, well, Paul just mentioned a fantastic project that we're all involved with as a business and we're very, very proud of. And it's Salisbury Hospital. Um, when we first started looking at that, the customer had a great idea of what they wanted. But one of the challenges was the aging infrastructure of the building and how you get all of the services into a, a, a form where you can manage it. So what we did was we, we looked at a decentralized approach and working with uh, Paul and the team in Acid Plus, uh, we came up with the various amounts of solutions to satisfy each plant room. But every time it was different. If you looked at every application, it was a different way. So where we looked at a, a, a swimming pool and a leisure center, for example, we, um, we looked at a, a, a heat pump that will directly heat the water for the, for the domestic services, for the, the, the showers and the sinks. And then we looked at another heat pump then will just heat the swimming pool up. And then when we got down to the central plant, we started looking more intelligently because we had to draw on air sourced heat pumps to generate the first stage of hot water and elevate that using water sourced heat pumps in the second stage to get us to the domestic hot water services. But the key to this now is the efficiencies of those systems are all sort of you know threes and fours. What, what the key piece of that large plant room piece for us was understanding the load profile of the building and then diving into the cooling situation so what have they got simultaneously running? So in the middle of winter, you might have had a, a megawatt of uh, heat requirements. But in the middle of uh, winter, we've also got sort of three to 400 kilowatts of cooling requirement. And then when we apply a heat pump into that space, that becomes so exciting because what you end up with then is a total consumed power ratio, which mm. is just phenomenal. That makes a blinding difference to the performance of the overall COP of the system. And then add into that, we started looking at where we were going to site the air source heat pumps. So we've got a, a condenser field outside, which is running the uh, running the, the chiller plant, so re rejecting the heat from the chillers. So to us, it was the obvious place to site the air source heat pumps because they are then generating cold air, which is mm. reducing overall the 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 uh, ambient around the condenser surface area. So it was a great project to see that. But that's just one, right? We've got lots of good examples. I, um, I'd be very proud to have worked uh, with a, a module construction company for many years. And, uh, and one of the things we worked hard with them on was to develop their part L solution to, to become more compliant. So we moved them away from combustion boilers. We've moved them into uh, direct heating for domestic hot water again with using heat pumps. We've uh, looked at the air handling systems, the simultaneous heating and cooling, and we've put heater batteries in, we've put DX cooling in. But more importantly, the larger scheme systems that we've managed to get four pipe solutions in, which will simultaneously heat and cool those air handlers. Now, those are just some of the projects and we're doing those continuously. And we're very, very proud that we're continuously looking to see what, can, what we can change and adapt. And then intelligently connecting those back to the BMS system and getting some remote connectivity going to make sure that we can remotely check them and maintain them to maximize the efficiencies is wonderful. Yeah. I love it. I, lo I love how, uh, you, you know, you can see uh, uh, nodding heads on the screen here and we all come alive when we start talking about how these engineered <laughs> solutions are working. I think it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. um, Paul, uh, Tobin, coming to you, you know, again, we, you know, we're talking, what about digital? Give us some success yeah. stories on the digital deployment as well. Yeah, there's lots and lots of examples, you know, anywhere from commercial real estate, once they got this level of intelligence via Open Blue, that they were able to stop heating and lighting under occupied areas, you know, potentially floors or rooms that they were heating and lighting when they didn't need to be. So, you know, and there's 30, 40% savings um, examples that we can give, um, which is great. But there's also, you know, in, in North America, for example, we've got a great case study in Humber River um, Hospital where, you know, they've taken the digital hospital to the next level and they're moving drugs and linen around the hospital via robots, for example. So again, there's a, you know, there's a, a various degree of digital, if you like, that, that you can go down. But I think the one that stuck in, in my mind just recently was from a university here in London. 
and what they were doing was manually going around and um, checking if you like which areas were utilized and which were not being utilized and effectively sure enough when they were doing that manual questionnaire every area was occupied apparently um, according to the, the manual kind of questionnaire that they had filled in however when we deployed sensors and attached it up to the dashboards we actually saw that a lot of those areas were far 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 less um, occupied than 100 percent and therefore what it allowed the, to the conversation um, it allowed to happen is going back to Paul Burnett's point having a conversation with the, the finance department and talk about actually you know we could repurpose this space and whether that be in a hospital environment to increase ward size or um, you know clinical space or whatever but for this university I think really strikingly and cleverly what they did is they actually said look we don't need all the space that we currently have therefore we'll create you know that that empty space if you like that we're not using and we'll actually sublet it out and lease it out so they actually lease it out to a police force who are, are based there now if you like and a call center and they um, utilize that area so I just think from a finance perspective it's really clever that a digital open blue conversation can actually represent not only cost savings, energy savings, emission savings, everything you might expect, but it can also be a revenue generating exercise for the client. And I think that's really powerful when you're going to talk to a CFO, you're talking to board C-suite members, then I think that will resonate potentially over and above sometimes some of those other messages. But So I just thought it was a really powerful yeah. use of the technology to, like I say, become a commercial reason for revenue generation as opposed to the kind of saving conversation that you might expect. Yeah, very good. Very good. Look, I, I'm conscious of time as well. I think it's been a super, super conversation. And hopefully this, for everyone listening, there's been some great, great points of discussion. I, I wanted to just unapologetically kind of raise one point. I know, Paul Burnett, you talked earlier around there's, there's finance instruments around at the moment that are helping provide stimulus. But I think you know, when you look at it from a, um, I'll talk at it from a European level, but I think it's somewhere in the region of 90% of the investment required to get us where we need to be from a net zero perspective has to come from private finance, right? So there's a there's a lot of really, really good stimulus out there that governments are putting into the market to help drive this, but it, it is not devoid of the need for private finance too. So I think, you know, just, just for those that are listening in on the call as well, you know, if you have access to these schemes, fantastic. If you've had access to them, but you still need more, there are ways in which we as an organization are working to also support the funding of these initiatives as well. So, you know, if, if there's a question mark on, you know, yeah, we want to do it and we've got a part grant for this, but we need more you know, we, we would be more than happy to have those conversations as well. So look, in closing, I'd just like to thank Paul, Paul and Richard. I think, you know, really useful insights there, I think. And, and I'm sure we could probably spend three hours on each topic and still not cover everything. So yeah. I think th thank you for your time and, and really appreciated it. And for those listening, if, if anything that's been discussed today kind of resonates or you think, ah, I didn't realize that Johnson Controls did that, or you're already working with us and you just want more support in some of the other areas, we'll flash up in a minute on the screen some, some ways in which you can reach out to us um, so you can get in contact with us and, and explore you know, how we can support you better. Um, we'll also be sending out following this call a short survey. We'd really appreciate your feedback because, as I said at the beginning, this is the first of hopefully many. We want this to resonate, not just to be a kind of a, a pitch, but something that you can take practically, that you can that can support any considerations and decision making. So we would love your feedback, how the session was, what went well, what didn't go so well, and also future topics that you would love for us to, to cover as well. So look, thank you again for your time to get today we look forward to having the opportunity to work with you if we're not already but if we are already working together we look forward to continue to build on that as we drive towards a more sustainable future for all so thank you team thank you for all listening that concludes today's webinar